Hello there. How are you guys doing today? Uh, welcome to this virtual neighborhood. And uh, you know, remember how last time we were going on that, uh, or two times ago, we were going on that gummy bear hunt. And remember how we lost Father Kermit? He sort of jumped off of the page and we weren't able to find him. Well, look, it looks like we found him. And you see what he's reading right now? I think he was catching up with some of the other chapters right now. So, uh, Father Kermit, maybe if you want, why don't we put you right over here so you can be a part of this adventure as well, okay? So it is great to see all of you. Does anyone know, uh, what did we celebrate yesterday? Yesterday we celebrated that feast, that big, big feast when Jesus comes into Jerusalem during this time of Holy Week, and he... All these people, they take branches from the trees. And in, in that part of the world, their trees were palm branches. So they actually took those and they waved them. And they said, Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And so, so Jesus came into Jerusalem. And now we're going to hear about some of the rest of that story. About how Jesus on Thursday, this coming Thursday, he's going to celebrate the first Mass, the first Eucharist, and he's going to make the first priests. So if you see a priest, you can wish him happy birthday on Thursday, or you can send him a card, you know, even send a little card or something on Thursday and just say, happy birthday, Father so-and-so. Um, thank you for your priesthood. So that's a wonderful way of being able to reach out to, be able to reach out to priests on this day of their priest birthday. So um, then on Friday, we know the story about how Jesus died on the cross. Um, so at three o'clock in the afternoon on Friday, this Friday is when we remember Jesus dying on the cross. But remember how he died on the cross, but he didn't, he didn't just stay in that tomb. We know that on Easter, he rose. And that's why we're able to say, Alleluia. We can't say it right now because it's Lent. But we can say that once it comes to Easter, we can cry out, Alleluia. So get ready. It's going to be a wonderful, wonderful experience. And so it's important for us to make sure that we keep our eyes fixed on the Lord so that he can show us that he is our joy. And no matter what's going on in our world, even during these tough times right now, in which we're kind of cooped up in our houses, this is a time in which Jesus Christ still wants to be Lord. So let's, let's say a prayer right now. How about that? How about that, Father Kermit? Um, yeah, let's do that. All right. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Lord, we thank you for this holy week. We thank you, Lord, for walking with us, even in difficult moments. We know that you always love us, and you never, ever leave us alone. So, Lord, help us to carry our palm branches, the palm branches of our hearts, that we might be able to praise you, Lord, each and every day, in the morning and in the evening, in the midday and in the afternoon, that we can always say, Jesus, you are our Lord. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. You know, I want to tell you also just an amazing story that I was thinking about. And it's about someone named St. Faustina. St. Faustina is the one who gave us that wonderful image, that divine mercy image. Um, I don't know if you've ever seen that before, but it's Jesus with his hand like this, and there's red and there's white coming out like that, which is his blood and water. But you know, St. Faustina, she was once a little girl, maybe about seven years old, maybe eight years old, and there was one time in which she wasn't able to get to Mass. Um, and she was really, really sad because she wasn't able to receive the Eucharist. And, and maybe you might be feeling that right now. Maybe you might be feeling, 
Um, maybe some of you are getting ready for First Holy Communion saying, oh, I really want to receive Jesus, but it seems like it's going to be such a long time. Well, St. Faustina, guess what she did in those moments? When she was, she lived on a farm, and she could see way off in the distance the church. And, and there were these big, big, giant church bells that were able to ring and ring and ring and ring whenever special moments of the Mass happened. So what do you think one is, what's one of the most special, what's one of the specialest moments that you can think of during Mass? Do you remember when the priest goes like this? And he says, take this, all of you, and eat of it. This is my body, which will be given up for you. And then he lifts up his hands, and you know that host that's right there, that, that was bread? It turns into the body of Christ. And in that moment, you know how sometimes at church we hear the ding, 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 ding. I remember once my nephew, um, when we didn't have any bells, and he always knew that the bells came at that time, he just sort of made a bell noise. So we didn't have any bells, and he was maybe, I think, like four years old, and he just went ding, 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 ding. So he knew how powerful those bells are to remind us that something special is about to happen. So St. Faustina, she was outside and she looked over to where the church was and she heard those bells. And guess what she did? She knew that Jesus Christ was coming on that altar way over there at that church. And she knelt down right on her farm. She just knelt on the ground. She folded her hands and she made what's called a spiritual communion. So it's in those moments where you can't necessarily receive Jesus right now on your hand or on your tongue. But she said, I can't receive you right, right now, but I know that your mercy is so great that you can come into me even from all the way over there. And so she knelt and she prayed and she said, Jesus, come into my heart right now. I can't receive you sacramentally that means when like the body of christ actually goes on our tongue and then we eat it but we can like saint faustina say i can't receive you in that way right now but i know that you love me and you want to walk with me so i'm going to receive you spiritually so that's something that you can do um, every time that mass happens which is every single day so not just on sundays but every single day Priests are celebrating Mass. And you can go into your heart and say, Lord, I want you to come right into my heart, and I'm opening up the door, and I'm even putting out the welcome mat to say, you are welcome. Come into my heart. Isn't that a beautiful thing? So that's what St. Faustina can teach us. St. Faustina lived in Poland, and then she became a sister, and then our Lord came to her and said, I want you to teach people about my mercy, how much I love them. But she started when she was a kid, loving Jesus by kneeling on, down right in her farm and being able to pray to Jesus way over at the church. So that's something to think about um, each and every day. How about that? So St. Faustina, pray for us. So, um, we are getting ready for the next chapter of the Chronicles of Narnia, The Lion, Witch, and the Wardrobe. And right before I do that, I want to tell you about this exciting thing that's happening. Um, it's called the Neighborhood Kindness Challenge. And some of you have already seen that. Some of you have already been a part of that. But it's something that we're doing through our school here of St. Mary's here in Plano. And uh, you can look at it at our Facebook page. It just says Neighborhood Kindness Challenge. There's even like hashtag royal kindness, but we're trying to be able to remind all of us the importance of doing those kind things to really be a neighbor to another person. Because remember, this is a virtual neighborhood right now, and there are ways in which we can pray for one another, we can lift one another up, and we can help people who are in need, or maybe those that are helping us right now, like the police officers, and the firefighters, and the nurses, and the doctors, and the grocery store workers, all those different people are helping us during this time. So we can help them with our kindness. So already people from Florida, 
from Tennessee, from Texas, from Maryland, and from here in Illinois have been a part of this. So if you'd like to be a part of that too, um, I mean, they've been doing some really, really cool things. Like this is what they've been doing. They said, we've had families making food for neighbors, families buying food for essential workers, people stepping up to make masks and headbands for nurses so that they can help people, people picking up garbage, making the world a nicer place and a cleaner place, people praying for each other. That's super, super important. Families writing wonderful messages to each other, even like on chalk. Have you ever seen on like sidewalks where they write these beautiful messages, maybe wishing someone a bir happy birthday or maybe just telling them that they're loved by God. It's a beautiful thing. And then people collecting food for those in need. So those are some of the things that have been happening already. And think about what are ways that you too can be creative and being a part of this. So for all of you who have been helping with that, thank you guys so much. All right, so... We are now in chapter 10. This is called The Spell Begins to Break. Do you remember how Edmund, he went to the palace of the White Witch and he thought he was going to get Turkish delight, but he didn't. In fact, he met a very mad and angry witch. And he now became a prisoner of her because now Edmund told her that Aslan has come and the children are going to the stone table to meet him. And the children are now at the beaver's house. And so the last thing that we heard was that the witch was going to say, make ready our sledge and use the harness without bells. In other words, let's sneak up on them so that we can destroy them. But now we hear about Mr. and Mrs. Beaver, and the other three children who are with her, who are with them. <clears throat> Chapter 10, the spell begins to break. Now we must go back to Mr. and Mrs. Beaver and the other three children. As soon as Mr. Beaver said, there's no time to lose, everyone began bundling themselves into coats, except Mrs. Beaver, who started picking up sacks and laying them on the table and said, now, Mr. Beaver, just reach down, get that ham, and here's a packet of tea, and there's sugar, and some matches, and if someone will get some two or three loaves out of the crock over there in the corner. What are you doing, Mrs. Beaver, exclaimed Susan. Packing a load for each of us, dearie, said Mrs. Beaver very coolly. You didn't think we'd set out on a journey with nothing to eat, did you? But we haven't time, said Susan buttoning the collar of her coat. She may be here any minute. That's what I say, chimed in Mr. Beaver. Get along with you all, said his wife. Think it over, Mr. Beaver. She can't be here for a quarter of an hour at least. But don't we want to get as big a start as we can possibly get, said Peter, if we're to reach the stone table before her? You've got to remember that, Mrs. Beaver, said Susan. As soon as she looked as soon as she looked in here and finds we're gone, she'll be off at top speed. That she will, said Mrs. Beaver, but we can't get there before her, whatever we do, for she'll be on a sledge and we'll be walking. Then, then we have no hope, said Deary. Now don't get so fussy, there's a dear, said Mrs. Beaver, but just get half a dozen clean handkerchiefs out of the drawer because we've got, cause we've got hope. We can't get there before her, but we can keep under cover and go by ways she won't expect, and perhaps we'll get through. That's true enough, Mrs. Beaver, said her husband, but it's time we were out of this. And don't you start fussing either, Mr. Beaver, said his wife. There, that's better. There's five loads and the smallest for the smallest of us. That's you, my dear, she added, looking to Lucy. Oh, do please come on, said Lucy. Well, I'm nearly ready now, answered Mrs. Beaver at last, allowing her, her husband to help her with her snow boots. I suppose the sewing machine's too heavy a thing to bring. Yes, it is, said Mr. Beaver, and a great deal too heavy. And you don't think you'll be able to use it while we're on the run, I suppose. I can't abide the thought of that witch fiddling with it, said Mrs. Beaver, and breaking it or stealing it as likely as not. Oh, please, please, please do hurry, said the three children. 
And so at last they all got outside and Mr. Beaver locked the door. It'll delay her a bit, he said. And they all set off, carrying their loads over their shoulders. The snow had stopped and the moon had come out when they began their journey. They went in single file. First, Mr. Beaver, then Lucy, then Peter, then Susan, and Mrs. Beaver last of all. Mr. Beaver led them across the dam and so on to the right bank of the river and then along a very rough sort of patch among the trees right down by the river bank. The sides of the valley shining in the moonlight towered up far above them on either hand. Best to keep down here as much as possible, he said. She'll have to keep on to the top, for you couldn't bring a sledge down here. It would have been pretty and it would have been a pretty enough scene to look at through a window from a comfortable armchair. But even as things were, Lucy enjoyed it at first. But as they went on walking and walking and walking, and as the sack she was carrying felt heavier and heavier, she began to wonder how she was going to keep up at all. And she stopped looking at the dazzling brightness of the frozen river with all its waterfalls of ice and at the white masses of the treetops and the great glaring moon and the countless stars and could only watch the little short legs of Mr. Beaver going pad, 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 pad through the snow in front of her as if they were never going to stop. Then the moon disappeared and the snow began to fall at once. And at last Lucy was so tired that she almost, she was almost asleep and walking at the same time when suddenly she found that Mr. Beaver had turned away from the river bank to the right and was leading them steeply uphill into the very thickest bushes. And then as she came fully awake, she found that Mr. Beaver was just vanishing into a little hole in the bank, which had been almost hidden under the bushes until you were quite on top of it. In fact, by the time she realized what was happening, only his short, flat tail was showing. Lucy immediately stooped down and crawled in after him. Then she heard noises of scrambling and puffing and panting behind her, and in a moment, all five of them were inside. Wherever this is, said Peter's voice, sounding tired and pale in the darkness. Or wherever is this, said Peter's voice, sounding pale and tired in the darkness. I hope you know what I mean by a voice sounding pale. It is an old hiding place for beavers in bad times, said Mr. Beaver, and a great secret. It's not much of a place, but we must get a few hours sleep. If you hadn't all been, if you hadn't all been in such a, a big fuss when we were starting, I'd have brought some pillows. Imagine her bringing all these things, pillows and a sewing machine. Wow. It wasn't nearly as such a nice cave as Mr. Tumnus's, Lucy thought, just a hole in the ground, but dry and earthy. It was, a very, it was very small, so that when they all lay down, they were all a bundle of clothes together. And what with that and being warmed up by their long walk, they were really rather snug. If only the floor of the cave had been a little smoother. Then Mrs. Beaver handed round a dark little flask out of which everyone drank something. It made one cough and splutter a little and stung the throat, but it also made you feel deliciously warm after you'd swallow it. And everyone went straight to sleep. It seemed to Lucy only the next minute, though it was really hours and hours later, when she woke up feeling a little cold and dreadfully stiff and thinking how she would like a hot bath. Then she felt a set of long whiskers tickling her cheek and saw the cold daylight coming in through the mouth of the cave. But immediately after that, she was very wide awake indeed, and so was everyone else. In fact, they were all sitting up with their mouths and their eyes wide open, listening to a sound, which was the very sound they had all been thinking of, and sometimes imagining they heard during their walk last night. It was the sound of jingling bells. Mr. Beaver was out of the cave like a flash the moment he heard it. Perhaps you think, as Lucy thought for a moment, that this was a very silly thing to do. But it was a very sensible thing. He knew he could scramble to the top of the bank among the bushes and brambles without being seen. And he wanted above all to see which way the witch's sledge went. 
The others sat all in the cave waiting and wondering. They waited nearly five minutes. Then they heard something that frightened them very much. They heard voices. Oh, thought Lucy, he's been seen. She's caught him. Great was their surprise when a little later, they heard Mr. Beaver's voice calling to them from just outside the cave. It's all right, he was shouting. Come out, Mrs. Beaver, come out, sons and daughters of, Ad of Adam. It's all right, it isn't her. This was bad grammar, of course, but that is how beavers talk when they get excited. I mean, in Narnia, in our world, they don't usually talk at all. Beavers usually don't talk at all. I don't know if you've ever met a talking beaver before, but in, uh, in Narnia, when they talk, when they get excited, they don't always use bad grammar, or they don't always use good grammar. So, Mrs. Beaver and the children came bundling out of the cave, all blinking in the daylight with earth all over them, looking very frosty and unbrushed and uncombed and with the sleep in their eyes. Come on, cried Mr. Beaver, who was almost dancing with delight. Come and see, this is a nasty knock for the witch. It looks as if her power is already crumbling. What do you mean, Mr. Beaver, panted Peter as they were all scrambled up the steep bank of the valley together. Didn't I tell you, answered Mr. Beaver, that she made it always winter, do you remember the next part, and never Christmas. Didn't I tell you? Well, just come and see. What do you think it is? And then they were all at the top, and did see. It was a sledge, and it was reindeer with bells on their harness. But they were far bigger than the witch's reindeer, and they were not white, but brown. And on the sledge sat a person who everyone knew the moment they set eyes on him. He was a huge man in a bright red robe, bright as holly berries, with a hood that had fur inside it, and a great white beard that fell like a foamy waterfall over his chest. Do you know who this is? Everyone knew him because though you see people of this sort only in Narnia, you see pictures of them and hear them talked about even in our world, the world on this side of the wardrobe door. But when you really see them in Narnia, it's rather different. Some of the pictures of Father Christmas in our world make him look only funny and jolly. But now that the children actually stood looking at him, they didn't find it quite like that. He was so big, so glad, and so real that they all became quite still. They felt very glad, but also solemn. I've come at last, he said. She has kept me out for a long time, but I have got in at last. Aslan is on the move. The witch's magic is weakening. And Lucy felt running through her that deep shiver of gladness, which you only get if you are being solemn and still. And now, said Father Christmas, for your presence. There is a new and better sewing machine for you, Mrs. Beaver. I will drop it in your house as I pass. If you please, sir, said Mrs. Beaver, making a curtsy, it's locked up. Locks and bolts don't make a difference to me, said Father Christmas. And as for you, Mr. Beaver, when you get home, you will find your dam finished and mended and all the leaks stopped and a new gate fixed. Mr. Beaver was so pleased that he opened his mouth very wide and then found that he couldn't say anything at all. Have you ever been so excited that you're just like, and you don't really know what else to say? Oh, that's Mr. Beaver right now. Peter, Adam's son, said Father Christmas. Here, sir, said Peter. These are your presents, was the answer. They are not tool, they are tools, not toys. The time to use them is perhaps near at hand. 
bear them well. With these words, he handed to Peter a shield and a sword. The shield was the color of silver, and across it there ramped a red lion, as bright as a ripe, as a ripe strawberry at the moment when you pick it. The hilt of the sword was of gold, and had a sheath and a sword belt and everything it needed. And it was just the right size and weight for Peter to use. Peter was silent and solemn as he received these gifts, for he felt they were a very serious kind of present. Susan, Eve's daughter, said Father Christmas, these are for you. And he handed her a bow and a quiver full of arrows and a little ivory horn. You must use the bow only in great need, he said, for I do not mean you to fight in the battle. It does not easily miss. And when you put this horn to your lips and blow it, then wherever you are, I think help of some kind will come to you. Last of all, he said, Lucy Eve's daughter. And Lucy came forward. He gave her a little bottle, what, a little bottle of what looked like a glass, but people said afterwards that it was made of diamond and a small dagger. In this bottle, he said, there is a cordial made of the juice of one of the fire flowers that grow in the mountains of the sun. If you or any of your friends is hurt, a few drops of this will restore them. And the dagger is to defend yourself at great need, for you also are not to be in the battle. Why, sir, said Lucy, I think, I don't know, but I think I could be brave enough. That is not the point, he said, but battles are ugly when women fight. And now, here he suddenly looked less grave. Here is something for the moment for all of you. And he brought out, I suppose from a big bag at his back, but nobody quite saw him do it, a large tray containing five cups and saucers, a bowl of lump sugar, a jug of cream, and a great big teapot all sizzling and piping hot. Then he cried out, Merry Christmas! Long live the true king! And he, crap, he cracked his whip, and he and the reindeer and the sledge and all were out of sight before anyone realized that he had started. Peter had just drawn his sword out of his sheath and was showing it to Mr. Beaver, when Mrs. Beaver said, Now then, now then, don't stand talking there till the tea's gone cold, just like men. Come and help and carry the tray down, and we'll have some breakfast. What a merry, what a mercy I thought of bringing the bread knife. She brought the bread knife, and now she can use it. So down the steep bank they went, and back to the cave, and Mr. Beaver cut some of the bread and ham into sandwiches, and Mrs. Beaver poured out the tea, and everyone enjoyed themselves. But long before they had finished enjoying themselves, Mr. Beaver said, Time to be moving on now. And that is the end of this chapter. Isn't that awesome that Father Christmas, remember how it said, it's always winter and never Christmas, that's part of the witch's curse to hold on to Narnia, but now Father Christmas was able to get in, which means that Christmas is coming again, which means that Christ is coming in. And it'll be interesting to see whether winter remains or if that goes as well. You notice also the, the presents that they received they were not Legos, they were not SpongeBob SquarePants, but they were very solemn gifts. They were very serious gifts. Peter received a sword and a shield. Susan, a bow and a quiver of arrows and a horn that whenever she was in grave danger, help would come. And Lucy received a dagger to defend herself but also this little bottle 
that would be able to heal anyone who was wounded in battle. Do you see how they were being equipped for battle? You know who equips us for battle? It is the Lord and is the Holy Spirit. I'd love to tell you a story, actually, um, about the armor of God. Did you know that you are a soldier of the Lord? Maybe some of you, maybe you, you play soldier, you play, uh, maybe you have camouflage, or maybe when you grow up, you want to um, you want to be a soldier or so, but you know, right now, because of your baptism, you were made a soldier of God. And we have armor to defend ourselves in this battle. Because this is a battle in which we're not fighting. St. Paul actually talks about this in Ephesians 6. If you ever want to open your Bible sometime and look up Ephesians 6, and it talks about the armor of God. And I remember when I was about five, six, something like that. I was little. And I don't know if when you were little, if you ever had tamper tantrums before. You know what a tamper tantrum is? Um, it, it's kind of like, maybe maybe Father Kermit can kind of show us what it's like. So it's kind of like, oh, this is so bad. Oh, I'm so mad. I'm so mad. Do you see how Father Kermit was um, kind of showing us what a tamper tantrum looks like? Have you ever done that before? where you just get kind of mad and, and you get kind of grumpy and people try to help you and you're like, no, maybe like your little brothers and sisters do that right now. Maybe when you weren't able to play on the, maybe when you had to clean your room and you weren't able to play on your PlayStation or your Xbox or so, and you get kind of grumpy, get a tamper tantrum. Well, when I was, I think five or six, I remember uh, going into a tamper tantrum. And I was just mad about something. I don't know. Maybe I didn't get a chocolate chip cookie or something like that. And my, my poor mom was like thinking, you know, what am I going to do? And God kind of gave her a thought in her mind to say, tell Andy about Ephesians 6, the armor of God. And she's like, okay. So then she looks at me and she says, hey, Andy. And I'm still getting in my tamper tantrum and stuff like that. And she said, did you know that you can be a soldier of the most high God? Now, usually if you say that to like a five-year-old, they'd be like, what? But the Holy Spirit kind of touched my heart. And I was like, what? And she's like, come here. And then she opened up the Bible. She sat me on her lap. And then she started to read about being a soldier for Christ, having the helmet of salvation the breastplate of righteousness, the belt of truth, the shield of faith, the sandals of the gospel of peace, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. And then she said, Andy, you're called to fight on the Lord's side, to fight in the Lord's army. And it's a different kind of fighting. It's not a fighting of being mean, of being cruel. It's not of hurting others, but it is of truly loving others, of being merciful to one another, of being kind, of being filled with joy, love, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, goodness, self-control. And then I just was really excited and then what she did is then she took cardboard, construction paper and stuff, and she made me an armor suit of God. And it had a cross on it with a shield, and I put all this stuff on, and I took one of my plastic swords, and I started running around the house being a soldier for God, fighting against the dragons. And that never left me. You might not realize, I, I actually, before I was thinking of being a priest, I was thinking of working in the U.S. Navy on submarines. And there was something in my heart of still wanting to be a soldier. And yet the Lord called me to be a soldier in a different way, to be a priest. And to be able to say, Lord, you are my captain. And how am I called right now to help your people come to say yes to you even more? To defend the people of God 
and through helping them discover the Word of God. And so you too are called to be a soldier, maybe even a captain, to serve Jesus Christ. And so what I encourage you to do is maybe sometime open up the Bible and look at Ephesians 6. Ask your mom and dad maybe to read it to you. And it talks about standing strong in the might of the Lord. And you know how Father Christmas was giving all those different tools, not toys? Jesus Christ gives you strength and power and wisdom to know how to be a soldier for him. That's his Holy Spirit. His Holy Spirit wants to come upon you. That's what we receive in, 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 in baptism, but then it gets stronger in confirmation. And so maybe some of your older brothers and sisters, maybe they're getting ready to be confirmed. Well, they're getting ready to have their armor strengthened, almost like an Iron Man suit that's activated. And then they're ready for battle, but a battle of not being mean and cruel, but of actually being loving and kind. So ask the Lord, say, Lord, give me this armor. Help it to be activated. Help me to be a true Iron Man that allows the Holy Spirit, to make the Iron Man suit, which we can think of that as the armor of the Holy Spirit, to be activated so then I can help my neighbor in need. So Father Christmas shows us an image of giving the children in this story the armor of God. Let's pray that they use it wisely, and we're going to find what happens with that next time. So I will see you guys tomorrow. And let's say a prayer. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Let's pray the Hail Mary together. Because Mary also covers us with her mantle, that's her cloak, which she also protects us and strengthens us to be able to fight as a soldier for Jesus Christ. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. And may the Lord bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. So, Father Kermit, I think we're going to see them tomorrow then, right? Yep. Um, see you all later, alligators. All right. Thank you very much. And I will see you guys later. God bless you.